NBS Happening Now. Keeping it here on NBS Television, where we are taking you live to Munyonyo, where Kanoi Mugume is currently at the speakers at the Commonwealth Speakers Conference and presiding officers. The opening ceremony. Over to you, Kanoi, in Munyonyo, to tell us what is going on on ground. Now, President Museveni is officiating and opening the ceremony today. It is the 27th Annual Speakers Conference. Over to you, Kanari Mugume. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Well, we are coming to you live from Munyonyo, where the conference for the speakers and presiding officers for Commonwealth is happening. And uh, this is the official opening ceremony. And uh, the speakers from different countries, I'm talking about Lesotho, Mozambique, Namibia, Mauritius, Malaysia, of course, a representative from Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, and many other countries, more than two, 25 uh, presiding officers and speakers uh, already here. And uh, well, they have already made their position into their seats. And what we're waiting for is uh, President Jerem Seveni, who will be, of course, presiding over this function. In attendance here, uh, the Speaker of Parliament, Anita Aneta Mong, has uh, gone ahead to invite members of Parliament to be part of this opening ceremony. And that is a crowd that you are seeing in my background. Of course, a number of issues are going to be discussed today. But after this opening ceremony, where the President of Uganda, Jerem Seveni, will be presiding over, there's going to be a photo session where all speakers and presiding officers representing different countries, uh, rather different parliaments from different countries, uh, will be taking place um, a, a bit later on in about an hour or so. And then we'll later have, of course, uh, the remarks. Now, those remarks will be coming in from a different um, number of speakers of parliaments, but actionable points will be about climate change, environment, and the role of parliament. And later on in the afternoon, we'll see conversations happening about um, the uh, parliaments of Commonwealth being, um, of course, uh, inclusive and gender sensitive. And that's the conversation, that, of course, we'll be following today. Um, in my background is a number of MPs that have come to attend. Uh, but on the other side, there's um, a number of speakers from different countries. Um, let me just take you around here. Oh, you see a number of speakers from different countries that have already taken their seats. Um, these are from different countries. Uh, we'll see Maldives. We see Mauritius, uh, Mozambique, Namibia, uh, Lesotho, Malaysia, we're talking Nigeria, Rwanda, Samoa, um, we're talking India, uh, Guyana, Ghana, and many other um, um, countries that, um, of course, are represented here. And uh, we're looking forward. This is uh, the conference for the speakers and presiding officers uh, conference that is, of course, uh, happening here in Mignogno. Uh, yesterday, we saw... Uh, the standing committee that, uh, of course, was uh, chaired by Speaker Anita Aneta Mong uh, by the virtue that, uh, of course, uh, she is the host. And uh, we saw, of course, a number of them um, that did participate in that standing committee conversation where the agenda of the day was set. And that is uh, uh, what happened yesterday. Of course, uh, the Speaker Anita Aneta Mong uh, did emphasize that uh, the commitments from today should ensure uh, transparency, accountability, should ensure equity. And, um, of course, uh, we also understand that uh, the... Um, Republic of uh, Zimbabwe was kicked out of this particular conference in, um, you know, about 15 years ago, and she used the same opportunity to say that uh, maybe this conference should be a moment of reflection, see how far or what progress has been made uh, uh, to be able to reconsider Zimbabwe as part of uh, the CISPOC, the conference of speakers and presiding officers. That's what happened yesterday. Today, um, we'll be seeing, of course, the opening ceremony, the speakers and presiding officers 
officials from different countries have already taken their seats and are waiting for President Chair Seven, who will be presiding over this function. And uh, we'll later see how conversation conversations will be unfolding. But I want to actually speak to um, a number of uh, members of parliament here about the expectations on, uh, of course, what will be happening today. Uh, these members of parliament were invited by the speaker, Anita Neta Mong, um, and uh, they'll be part of this particular uh, function. I see um, a number of them, including ministers, actually, interestingly, also have um, opposition members of parliament. I think I've seen Mwadan Kunyinj around. Um, of course, um, and a number of them will be speaking to them about their expectations. Uh, remember that members of parliament actually, whether you're on the committee or not, um, they will not be part of these sessions of the speakers because this conference is specifically for the speakers and presiding officers of uh, countries in the Commonwealth. Uh, but they were allowed in here for the opening uh, ceremony. Let me speak to a number of them to um, get the idea on the expectations. Honorable Mr. can I speak to you for a minute, please? Thank you very much for joining us. You're live on NBS television. Um, Honorable Mujiche, what are your expectations from today, from this particular conference? Well, I expect that this is an opportunity for us to share experiences, an opportunity for, uh, for the speakers to share, uh, compare notes, an opportunity for us as a country uh, to see what is happening in other countries, other parliaments, in the past, we have had challenges as a parliament. You remember when the opposition walked out of parliament. Uh, it was uh, the first of its kind, how the speakers handled it. Maybe such an experience uh, being shared with another speaker from Tanzania or from Kenya, maybe they would advise, uh, they would advise uh, otherwise, or they would, have, they, they would borrow it from how it was handled. So for me, I think it is uh, an opportunity for us to compare notes, and uh, it puts us to another level. Now that everybody has come here, what about our democratic credentials? What about our human rights uh, record? How do we move forward after this conference? So for me, it's an opportunity for us to do better. It's a, an opportunity for us to keep standards. It's an opportunity for us to uh, uh, do better where we have not been doing well. It's an opportunity for us to correct the mistakes. It's an opportunity for us as a country to show cause as to why certain countries should remain friendly to Uganda because we are now in a club. If we are in a club of, of Democrats, then we must do everything possible to match there. So there are certain things we must drop, the negative ones, and there are certain things we must adopt as a country. Um, Top on agenda, especially today on the second day of the conference, is um, environment, climate change, and the role of parliament in ensuring that. Um, you've just returned from COP28. From your own experience um, as a member who sits on that committee, what do you think the role of parliament in, um, you, you know, trying to make sure that the effects of climate change um, are, are averted is? Of course, parliament does appropriation. Parliament does uh, um, make laws, so we must make sure there is compliance as we legislate, but also as we do oversight, so that uh, we don't just come up with uh, um, memorandums of understandings, don't just come up with uh, legislations, but and that the compliance is not just a certificate, but that, that we have agreed on, is it being uh, implemented on the ground? Because you can have a certificate of compliance in budgeting, you can have a certificate in, in, in legislation, but at the end of the day, the, the, the relationship between parliament and the executive, the executive who have mandate to implement, are they implementing, or we are just talking about uh, um, laws, or we are just about uh, conferences like this, and there's nothing on the ground. So for me, as a member of parliament, a legislator, is to make sure that we move an extra mile to make sure there's compliance. And lastly, Honorable Mishay, what, what are some of those things that you've seen elsewhere, um, you've benchmarked in other parliaments that you think that the Ugandan parliament needs to adopt? Of course, like I said, parliament is, we are the, as, as parliament, we, we speak for the voiceless. As, as parliament, we are the eyes and ears of the public. So I believe that uh, moving forward as, a, as parliament, we, first of all, we must make sure that our relationships with the executive are aligned to the fact that 
recommendations of uh, parliament, resolutions of parliament, don't just keep in, 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 gathering dust. That, the, 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 that after we have resolved, then, uh, like I have seen in other parliaments, that the president or the executive must implement the resolutions of parliament. Because I have seen that happen in other countries, in other parliaments, that has been missing, and it's, it, it, it's, it's a missing link that we must fix as a, a, as a parliament, as a country in Uganda. Thank you very much, Honorable Mizuche. Uh, we do appreciate your time. Well, as I speak right now, uh, President Jeremy Seveni is making his way to um, his seat and uh, he'll be of course uh, presiding over this opening ceremony of the conference for speakers and presiding um, officers of countries in the Commonwealth. Um, this is uh, of course uh, the 27th and the president will be presiding over. We've uh, seen uh, of course uh, speakers from different countries from across the world and Uganda is hosting this particular one. This particular conference uh, does happen every after two years, um, usually in early January and top on agenda, a number of issues are going to be discussed, including uh, security, uh, parliamentary diplomacy, and uh, climate change, a number of issues uh, that are in there lined up. So let's, uh, the president has arrived at uh, the venue. Let's uh, listen in on the events as uh, the opening ceremony does um, take kickstart. on the Deputy Speaker. We can ask that you stand still for the anthems, police bandits.
prayers. Almighty God, who in your infinite wisdom and providential goodness have appointed the offices of leaders and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of humanity, we beseech you to look upon with your abundant favor these your servants, whom you've been pleased to call to the performance of such important trusts in this land. Let your blessing descend upon them here assembled and grant that they may, as in your presence, treat and consider all matters that shall come under deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote your honor and glory and to advance the good of those whose interests you've committed to their charge. Amen. Your Excellency, we are joined in this conference by 33 speakers and presiding officers from the following countries. Barbados, Botswana, Cameroon, Dominican Republic, Ghana, Grenada, Guyana, India, Kenya, the Kingdom of Eswatini, Lesotho, Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Rwanda, Singapore, Samoa, Sri Lanka, South Africa, Tanzania, Trinidad and Tobago, Tonga, Uganda, and Zambia. We also have guests, speakers from South Sudan and from the East African Legislative Assembly. I would like to call upon the Right Honorable Speaker to make her welcome address to the conference. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, General Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, the Right Honorable Speakers and Presiding Officers present, the Right Honorable Prime Minister of Uganda, and the leader of government business, the right honorable leader of opposition in parliament, the cabinet ministers and ministers of state, the previous speakers of parliament of Uganda, the members of the diplomatic corps, colleagues, honorable members of parliament, representatives of the development partners, the Secretary General and staff of the Commonwealth Secretariat, the staff of Parliament and National Assemblies, the accompanying persons, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Parliament of the Republic of Uganda and on my own behalf, I welcome you to Kampala, Uganda, for the 27th Conference of Speakers and Presiding Officers of the National Parliaments of Independent Sovereignty States of the Commonwealth. It humbles us that many of you have traveled from land far and wide throughout the several hours to come and attend this conference and respect our invitation. You're most welcome. Your Excellency, the President, the Right Honorable Colleagues and Distinguished Guests, the Parliament of Republic of Uganda is immensely 
gratified to have you in this function. We want to thank you for giving us time to come and open this conference of the speakers and presiding officers. Hosting this conference in Kampala is indeed a remarkable milestone in the legislative history of Uganda and in the 11th Parliament of Parliament of Uganda. In a special way, allow me to thank you, His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, Yoweri Kagota Museveni, for honoring our invitation uh, to grace this function, and most importantly, for ensuring that this conference was well facilitated and the approval all came from you. We want to thank you so, so much. And we appreciate that gesture of the goodwill. Distinguished guests, I must pay tribute to our beloved president for his consistent support in enabling the interparliamentary engagements and particularly aiding and hosting conferences, especially like this one of the Commonwealth, the IPU, and I want to recognize that the president of the IPU is in the house. <clears throat> in the same vein, I also want to recognize the tremendous efforts of our local organizing committee that was led by Honorable Katuntu in ensuring that this timely and satisfactory organization in the 27 CISPOC conference that is starting today that the president is going to open officially. For historic context, the conference of speakers and presiding officers of the Commonwealth was established in 1969. And the initiative of then was by the Speaker of the House of Canada, the House of Commons of Canada. And that is when it was established. Your Excellency and distinguished guests, CISPOC operates on a two-year circle, holding a conference of the full membership every two years, usually in January, and a meeting of the standing committee at the same time in the intervening year. The conference is aimed at maintaining, foster, and encourage impartiality and fairness on the part of the speakers and the presiding officers of all the parliaments in the Commonwealth states. Two, to promote knowledge and understanding of parliamentary democracy in the various forms and develop parliamentary institutions. Your Excellency, and distinguished guests. The 27 CISPOC in Kampala is therefore in furtherance of the aforementioned objectives, which are in line with the Commonwealth values of democracy, human rights, international peace and security, tolerance, separation of powers, and rule of law. Hosting the 27 CISPOC in Uganda will accrue immense multiplier effect in widening our diplomatic frontier for cooperation through parliamentary diplomacy. To enhancing the tourism and trade shaping the image of Uganda among the international community of nations. Harmonization of legislative and parliamentary practices and procedures. Five, respect for partner states. 
irrespective of the size, the clout, the values, cultures, traditions, and where we disagree, we must do it respectfully. Six, uniformity in legislation and leveraging our international appeal as a hospitable destination. Your Excellency and honorable colleagues, our presence here is a testimony of our commitment to the co continuity and prosperity of the Commonwealth. We are immensely gratified that you have taken off time on your busy schedules to travel and attend this conference. We do not take this for granted. We are highly indebted to you, Your Excellency. We convey our sincere thanks to the outgoing leadership under the stewardship of the Right Honorable Speaker of the Republic of Cameroon for their confidence in our ability to organize and host this event. And indeed, we have the ability. Distinguished guests, the Parliament of Uganda is a unicameral multi-party parliament established under Article 77 of the National Constitution. It comprises of 529 elected members of parliament and 26 ex-official members, which, of which 34%, that is 189 members, are female. Besides the directly elected constituency representatives, the composition of Parliament of Uganda also includes women members of Parliament, the youth, persons with a disability, the workers MPs, the elders MPs, the National Army, that is Uganda People's Defense. Honorable colleagues and distinguished guests, this speaks to the inherent diversity that is characterized in Uganda as a nation having 46.2 million people spread across 65 indigenous communities as it is listed in the third schedule of our national constitution. Various religious groups, the diverse ethnic nationalities, and various interest groups are all recognized in the House or in Parliament. And this is where the cohesion begins from and the national unity. In all this, we pay tribute to the President, His Excellency the Yoweri Kagota Museveni, for his relentless commitment to realization of a just and a fair society that works for all the people of Uganda, irrespective of their age, creed, religion, gender, and race. Your Excellency and Honorable Colleagues, the conference topics have carefully been selected to stimulate discourse and sharing of the best practices and experience. And these topics are diverse and inclusive parliaments, that is the youth and gender sensitivity. Environment and climate change mitigation concerns, health and well-being in the parliament and parliamentarians, security and consensus building among the parliaments, especially where we have the multi-party system. 
I am confident that in this conference, it will provide yet another platform for us to hasten our collective resolve and direct our energies towards the greater equity and inclusivity, democratization, good governance, and the rule of law in the Commonwealth for the good of humanity that we do represent. Honorable colleagues, it is incumbent upon individual parliaments to devise mechanisms for effective monitoring of implementations of laws to establish the extent of its achievement to intended outcome in pursuit of desired democratic dividends. All the laws that we should pass should be followed and they should be implemented to the latter. Distinguished delegates, during your stay in Uganda, we have organized a rich and elaborate itinerary for a memorable experience. Uganda being the pearl of Africa, as rightly observed by the former British Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill, Uganda is indeed the pearl of Africa. We therefore invite you to enjoy every moment in this beautiful land that is gifted by nature. Your Excellency and my dear colleagues, the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the people of Uganda are incredibly warm and hospitable. Our national parks are well endowed with various species of flora and fauna, including the mammals, reptiles, birds, ins insects, and other forms of landscapes, most of which are unique to only Uganda. I would, I would request the video to be played to for you to be able to see where you are and how unique they are. The country is also blessed with some of the most beautiful ionic waterfalls along the majestic river Nile that I must see before you leave this country. Your Excellency, the President, please accept our sincere gratitude for your immense support towards our success of this conference, and also for personally being here to preside over this opening ceremony. You're most welcome. And forever, as legislature, we pledge our support to executive for the good working relationship that we have built. Right, honorable colleagues, I want once again, welcome you, and I hope your visit to Uganda will be an experience like no other. I therefore wish you a fruitful deliberation and stay in a beautiful country in Uganda. I say all this for God and my country. At this juncture, I now take the singular honor of inviting the Fountain of Honor, the President of the Republic of Uganda, His Excellency General Yoweri Kagota Museveni, to deliver his remarks and officially open the 27th Conference of Speakers and Presiding Officers of the Commonwealth. Kindly please rise up to receive the President. Okay, thank you so much. Sit down, please. The right
right honorable speaker Anita Among, the right honorable deputy speaker, and the right honorable visiting speakers, uh, the Prime Minister of Uganda, and all the distinguished guests. The, the gist of my remarks is like a, a slogan. And the slogan is, down with philosophical, ideological, and strategic shallowness. That is the gist of my uh, statement. I am glad to address you and welcome you to Uganda as speakers of the Commonwealth countries. The Commonwealth countries have a combined population of 2.4 billion people. Soon, we shall also host the NAM, the Non-Aligned Movement, and the group of 77 plus China meetings here in the next few days. Those countries of the two international organizations have a combined population of 6.4 billion people. In those fora, I want to use those occasions as one of the third generation of the anti-colonial resistance fighters of Africa to put our humble ideas to the world. The gist of our ideas could be summed up in the slogan, down with philosophical, ideological, and strategic shallowness, in quotes. The human race has been here for the last four and a half million years, beginning as homo sapiens sapiens. These were primates that had a superior brain, a hand that could hold tools and do work, and bipedalism that, unlike the reptiles whose, hands are whose, whose heads are constantly negotiating against obstacles on the ground, freeze our heads to see far and think. So we are not like reptiles, we think better because we, we are bipedal, walk on two legs. Is it this Homo sapiens sapien that has been the agent of change and transformation in societies all these millennia? These humans were only in Africa until about 100,000 years ago. That is when groups of humans started leaving Africa for other continents. You can therefore say that all the human race are either Africans, like we the Ugandans, or are former Africans, like those in Americas, Europe, Asia, and, and, and the Pacific. So all of you, you are either Africans or former Africans. And I welcome you, all of you. Initially, and up to today, man faced oppression from nature. That was the original problem of man, oppression from nature. By the floods, by the drought, diseases, etc. The humans, Unlike the other animals, however, did not fa these other animals also face the same. The elephants, the what, they all suffer from the uh, adverse phenomena of nature. The humans, unlike the other animals, however, 
did not face this problem of oppression of man by nature passively. This is the difference between man and the other animals. Man, using his ability to use his superior brain to think and his hands to work, strived to find solutions to, to the challenges thrown to him by nature. He started making tools to help him do work, the stone tools, the iron tools, until today, when he has got tractors, bulldozers, etc. These are all tools made by man to help him solve the problems he was, he was facing. One and a half million years ago, he invented fire, which enabled the human race to descend from the trees and become cave dwellers. The caves were more comfortable than the trees. They were warmer, rain-free, and safer. It is therefore this change in science and technology that is always the primer. This word primer, we use it in the army to mean uh, a, provo a provocator, initial provocator. You can call it the initiator, the primer of social economic transformation. However, along the way, another operation to man added itself. The original problem of man was oppression by nature. But along the way, another form of oppression added itself. That was oppression of man by fellow men. What is the form of this oppression? It is in the form of the wars of aggression, to kunyaga, kunyaga in our language means to, to loot. To, to kunyaga katro and capture women, enslave, make bahuku, slaves, displace people, ethnic cleansing, colonize, or simply dominate indirectly, even if one does not physically occupy the other person's territory, i.e. neocolonialism and semi-colonialism. Why oppress? It is because of greed. Yet this operation of man by fellow men is totally unnecessary and is also satanic and pagan. Indeed, St. Paul, in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 26, writes, and this is in quotes, and he, meaning God, has made from one blood every nation of men, you former Africans, all of you, you are from one, one group, on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord. This is what St. Paul says, that we are all from one source, and, but we were given our lands, each one was given his area, and, and the boundaries thereof. Therefore, for true believers, for true believers, imperialism and colonialism and expansionism by force, we are criminal and satanic. The present crisis we have in the Middle East could be traced back to Roman imperialism when at Masada, they dispersed the Jews. Those who know that history know what happened, how the Jews rose up against the Romans and they were dispersed. You can, this, was, this Masada was AD 70. AD 70, that's when I think it happened, if my history is, is, is still good. Up to now, we are dealing with the mistake of the Romans, you can imagine. What were the Romans doing in the Middle East? The present crisis, um, the, the first white man to come through our areas 
was Huntington Speak. He was an army officer from Britain, and his friend Grant in 1862. Here we had never seen any black person, any non-black person, until 1851, when when an Arab called Ibrahim came here. That was the first non-black person we ever, the, our people ever saw, and they thought he had no skin. They they had never seen. They, they thought he, he had no skin. Although Grant and Speak were sometimes delayed by some greedy chiefs, they managed to go by land from Bagamoyo in Tanzania all the way to Alexandria in Egypt. These, these uh, two British explorers went through here, two, just two of them, peacefully, all the way they were from Tanzania up to Alexandria in Egypt. Speak himself writes in his book, The Discover of the Source of the Nile, on pages 94, 95, how the Baganda, our, one of our groups here, uh, at Mtesa's court, at Mtesa's palace, Mtesa was one of our kings here, were admiring the items of trade he had brought, textiles, etc., by, by exclaiming, he writes, he, does, he, write, he writes wrongly because he writes in our, our language. He says that, that the people were saying, Irunji, Irunji, meaning Chirunji. It is good. So the people were appreciate, appreciating the products which speak came with, some of the products like textiles and so on. In Karagwe, Karagwe is in Tanzania, the benevolent and gentle giant king. Romanika gave so many gifts to these strangers, milk, beef, millet, so much that they hardly used any of their own resources when they were there. It was therefore possible to develop symbiotic relationships at that early stage among free peoples of different lands and continents. What was colonialism and in imperialism then for? What was the historic role of imperialism and colonialism? It was for greed and ignorance. We had to have vicious and colonial wars in India, the mutiny of 1857, the wars in Vietnam, China, Kenya, the Mau Mau, in Mozambique, Angola, Zimbabwe, Namibia, South Africa, Guinea-Bissau, to solve this problem now. Instead of coming like Speak, who came to explore and to trade, and he went peacefully all the way, now, when colonialism came, we had now to fight, fight colonialism. This is not talk of the most destructive inter-imperialist wars, the First and the Second World Wars, those wars or among Europeans, Germans, British, what have you, all those uh, wars in which we were involved. I am called Museveni. My name is Museveni because our parents, the word Museveni is a corruption of the English word seven. Now, the seventh regiment of the, of the British army was where many of the Ugandans served. So in their Bantu way, Bantu is our language, they said Aba Seveni, the people of the seventh. That's how, my, so Mo seven means one colonial soldier, so I'm one of those colonial soldiers. Because I was born in 1944, when the first, uh, veterans of, of that colonial, those intercolonial wars were, were, were coming back. When the dangerous illusion of empires was defeated, 
this is now how I come to the Commonwealth. Because when you talk of, of the Commonwealth, you must talk about it thoroughly and seriously, not just the talk, 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 talk. Uh, when the dangerous illusion of empires was defeated, the elders of the countries that had been part of the British Empire decided not to throw away completely some aspects we had got from the British. The, the English language, the English language is a, a captured property. I now speak it. If I want to, to uh, uh, insert everybody, I use, I use English. But it was brought by the British and we captured it here and kept it. And it's good because you can, when I met Her Majesty, <coughs> the Queen, on one of the occasions, I told her that the Commonwealth is one of the, of the international meetings where I go and I don't, have, I don't have to have earphones to translate for me. I speak directly, although we speak in different, uh, different accents, but you can hear what I'm saying. This is a very big advantage. 2.4 billion people using one language, understanding one language, which we got as a result of that temporary colonial interaction. The concept of representative government, which our daughter, Anita Mungu, was telling you about the, the MPs here. For, for us, we, we take representation very seriously. We have got how many constituencies? How many are they? The constituencies. You, you, you know or you don't know? How many constituencies? Three what? Clark. Huh? 314. Uh -huh. The constituencies are 314. So, if we were to do like they do in many countries, to only have constituencies, how many women do we have now who came from constituencies? They are 14 or what? Huh? One four. Ah, now you can hear. The, the, the constituencies are 314, where everybody competes. But out of the, of the 314, only 14 are women who defeated men and everybody else. Now, in our long struggle for democracy, we didn't agree that just constituency representation is enough. Because if it was enough, why is it that the women who are 51% of our population only bring out 14, 14, 14 women out of 314 opportunities? That's why we said, in addition to the constituency members of parliament, let also have special seats for women. From each district, from each district, the, the districts are, I think they are 130 something now. So that's how you get that big number of women. Then we have the seats for, for, for workers, factory work, uh, workers, we have, we have uh, delegates for youth and so on. So this concept of representative government, Br the British brought it to us and we liked it and, and expanded it. Separation of powers, mutually beneficial economic interactions, trading together. So therefore, although we re resisted uh, the, the nonsense of imperialism, 
which we think is a backward practice, satanic, St. Paul calls it pagan. When we defeated colonialism, we said no, but some good things have come from these people. Let's keep them and let's stay together now as equal people, no longer as colonized and, and colonizer, but as, 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 as brothers and sisters. This is what the, how the Commonwealth comes. Hence, the Commonwealth. What was problematic could be converted into something beneficial. In the United Kingdom right now and for some time, there is an active branch of my tribe comprised of our former British teachers and their, and their offsprings. I have my sub-tribe in the UK. But when I go there, I meet them. They are organized. The current chairperson of our branch is one of the daughters of our teacher, Mwarimu Sullivan, that was teaching, teaching us economics. The members of my tribal branch, including Mr. Rema, our chemistry teacher, who, who taught so many of the present medical doctors that we have in Uganda, because many of the medical doctors study chemistry, and this, this Mr. Rema taught many, many, of, many of them who went through that, that area. Another member of our branch in the UK is Mr. Reeves, who was our organizer when I was an actor of modest fame in the play of the murder in the cathedral by Robert Bolt. So I was, I was some sort of actor also. Those interactions between the colonizer and the colonized, although negative for most of the time, had also their positive sides that should be built on for mutual benefit. The problem, however, is the persistent philosophical, ideological, strategic shallowness and chauvinism of so many actors. This philosophical, ideological, and strategic uh, shallowness ignores the progress of the human race in taming the natural phenomena, phenomena that harm man and life and taming nature to improve the quality of human livelihood. The invention of fire one and a half million years ago, the invention of iron, the invention of agriculture for crops and for, then for livestock, the steam engine, electricity, the railway, the automobiles, the aircraft, automation of, of uh, factories, vaccines, AI and artificial intelligence, ETC, have shown that the quality of life of man can be improved greatly and exponentially by those human innov innovations, irrespective of the social systems they live under. Instead of, of, instead of using this human progress for the benefit of all, some actors, out of greed and philosophical, ideological, and strategic shallowness, miscalculate and seek to monopolize knowledge and also use knowledge to oppress others. Example, the iron tools were used for oppression. The gunpowder, the aircraft, the nuclear weapons, the rockets, ETC, were used for the same. The greed is a miscalculation. Because if you try to use knowledge to oppress others, they, they also tr strive to acquire knowledge to catch up with you and defeat you. It's such a waste of time. Why do you want to oppress me? Because I, I will counter-organize. This is why empires collapsed, all of them without exception. There's no empire which has ever survived. You can recount all of them because they are essentially evil. Empires are evil.
when Huntington Speak came here in 1862, Africans in this area did not know much about gunpowder. When, when Huntington Speak here, we didn't know about gunpowder. He's the one who, who came with gunpowder. Indeed, by 1900, the whole of Africa had been colonized because of gunpowder, except for Ethiopia. By 1994, the last European-controlled country in Africa, South Africa, had been liberated by the gunpowder of the Africans. <laughs> so Africans are now to acquire gunpowder to chase the, 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 the invaders. And the last one to be chased were the, the, the whites, the, the white domination in South Africa in 1994. A whole century had been wasted on account of promoting parasitism instead of symbiosis. A whole century from 1860s to 1994, fighting, fighting, fighting. In the last 64 years, ever since 1960, our movement, initiated by students, has been advocating for symbiosis instead of parasitism for actors within Uganda and outside. Let us concentrate on utilizing the progress of man in the struggle against the operation of man by nature rather than using that progress in science and technology for parasitism. Let us expunge all ideas of chauvinism, chauvinism of identity, religion, tribes, race, class, social class. If you think you are right, no. What is good for uh, what is good for the goose is also good for the gander. This is uh, uh, one of the English prover uh, proverbs. What is good for the goose is also good for the gander. What is good for you is good for everybody. If you want freedom, if you value freedom, then you should value the freedom of everybody. If you value independence, if you value dignity then you must, you must respect the dignity of everybody. Stop manipulations and lectures to the societies that are different from yours. If you think you are right, influence people by example. If you think you are right, influence people by example. In the book, in the book of Matthew, you know, you know here you will take Christians a bit seriously. So we, 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 we believe in the, the, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men, that they see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's what it says. It doesn't say lecture people, do that. No, you do good things. Then the people will see that what you, what you, you believe is good and they will, they, will, they will copy you voluntarily. With this posture, the world will be peaceful and the progress will be rapid. The Pope failed to maintain Catholicism over Europe by force in spite of the wasteful 30 years war and the Spanish Armada of 1588. You know, when, when Henry VIII of the UK wanted to, to marry another woman, and then the Pope tried to dictate, and then there was a split. Then instead of saying, okay, if you want to leave Catholicism, you, you are free. The, the Pope tried to impose, to impose Catholicism, to maintain dominance of Catholicism in Europe by, by, by force. What was the result? 30 years war. The Spanish Armada. And he failed. He couldn't. He failed. Metternich of Austria-Hungary failed to stop the rise of capitalism 
and bourgeois ideology that had been started by the French Revolution in 1789. This man, Metternich, was a feudalist. So he saw the French Revolution as a, as a threat. Then he thought he would stop it by war. And what was the result? Big problems for Europe, the Napoleonic Wars. The 14 intervention powers in Russia, when, when Russians took over, uh, Russia was taken over by communists. Some countries wanted to stop communism by force, and they intervened. The, the 14 intervention powers in Russia failed to stop the spread of communism. Why fight ideas? They are beneficial. Adam Smith helped us by clarifying the ideas of the free market in his book, The Source of the Wealth of Nations of 1776, exposing the mistakes of the physiocrats and the bullionists. The former believed that agriculture is the only source of value, and the latter believed gold was the source of wealth. And Adam Smith helped, us, helped the world greatly, and Europe in particular. Although the ideas of Adam, of Adam Smith helped the free market by clarifying the role of, speci of specialization, division of labor, free enterprise, and exchange, they had not and maybe could not have done, done so foreseen the limitation of their ideology when it came to aggregate demand and the role to be played by the state. That is how Maynard Keynes comes in after the capitalist crash of 1929. Yet Karl Marx had pointed out the importance of central planning. some years before, in his manifesto of 1848. All these ideas about society, especially wealth creation, add something, although they may overlook something else. We, the calm and greedy and development-minded people, have benefited from all these different and sometimes contradictory ideas. That is how we have been able to turn a very bad situation in Uganda into a positive one. I commend this, to, this approach to the Commonwealth, and it is my honor to declare what? Opened? To declare open yes. the, the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, on behalf of the speakers and the presiding officers who are present here, I want to extend our gratitude to you for delivering an inspiring and an insightful speech. Some of us have gotten to know what we didn't know before. Your words will undoubtedly foster a deeper sense of unity and collaboration among us, the speakers and presiding officers of the Commonwealth. We want to thank you again for your wisdom and guidance. And we are forever indebted to you. We want, I want to request my colleagues to give the president a round of applause for his very good speech. Thank you, thank you so much, Your Excellency. The anthems.
Excellency the President, our distinguished guests, as we come to the end of this function, uh, it gives me pleasure to invite the speakers to come for a collaborative, commemorative photograph. And as we prepare for the photo, we shall kindly ask that His Excellency the President and the speaker uh, will wait until the speakers are organized on the podium and then join them. So could I invite our distinguished speakers and presiding officers to kindly follow the protocol team as they lead you to the podium for the commemorative photograph. For all the rest of our guests, we kindly ask that you resume, take your seats, and wait until we finish with the photo. And thereafter, we shall invite you to have tea and coffee and lots of entertainment. Thank you very much. Uganda, home to high glaciers and the valley of nine lakes located in the mystical snow-capped mountains of the moon, also known as the Renzori Mountain Range, extending over 5,000 meters at the Margarita Summit, Africa's third tallest peak. Home to Lake Victoria, the world's largest tropical freshwater lake on the continent of Africa, producing one million tons of fish a year and employing thousands and supporting the livelihoods of millions. Home to the source of the Nile, the longest river in the world and source of adrenaline, your go-to for whitewater rafting, kayaking, bungee jumping, tubing, quad biking and sunset cruises. Home to the Murchison Falls, where the waters of the Nile with a loud crashing sound squeeze through a narrow gorge turning into the world's most powerful waterfall. Home to 20 primate species, the highest concentration of primates on the continent of Africa. Home to a total of 1,060 bird species, 11% of the world's bird species including some of the world's rarest and most spectacular birds. And now that was the um, opening ceremony of uh, the conference for speakers and presiding officers uh, for the Commonwealth happening here at Munyonyo Commonwealth Resort. And as you can see, the speakers and presiding officers are making their way for a photo session that is also part of uh, the program. Earlier on, uh, we just, uh, of course, uh, had from the speaker, Anita Anita Mo, who gave her opening remarks and uh, did talk about a number of things, including um, the warmth and hospitality of Ugandans. And, uh, well, also encouraged all the guests and dignitaries uh, to take off time off this conference and visit uh, some of uh, the um, places that Uganda has to offer, including national parks, uh, to look at uh, how Uganda is well endowed with various species of flora and fauna and uh, also invited them to enjoy the Pearl of Africa. Thereafter, the president did come in and uh, gave his uh, speech. The president talked about um, Operation One. He talked about how uh, the first nature of um, operation uh, that is by nature. And also talked about um, the operation that is by humankind. That's how he brought in about uh, colonialism and how uh, countries like Uganda and all the ones that are represented here um, came to be about uh, below or under the common wealth. And he talked about how that is, of course, uh, um, uh, unimaginable, uh, but also said that it is important that now that uh, the countries under commonwealth use that as an advantage uh, to redeem themselves and be able uh, to prosper. Uh, he also invited them to actually uh, be able to use that as an opportunity uh, to collaborate and work together for prosperity and development. What you're seeing right now is a photo session of uh, the speakers and presiding officers of the Commonwealth that is taking place here. Very many countries have been represented and uh, according to this uh, particular uh, session, 
uh, they're actually supposed to, of course, uh, take the photo in their formal regalia or um, where, of course, that's how all the speakers uh, decided to go by, uh, different speakers in the different regalia. Um, the president also uh, did talk about how Uganda will be hosting the non-allied movement and G77 in the next uh, couple of days. I'll be beginning on the January 15th up to the January 23rd. That will be this month and I uh, invited them, uh, they should join in, um, but also use that as an opportunity for Uganda uh, to showcase uh, what uh, the collaboration and um, a big market of more than six billion people in all those different groups uh, really means and how um, nations like Uganda can take advantage of that. Um, uh, what we know and understand from the agenda, also see that after this photo session, there will be breakout sessions the breakout sessions will be into two formats. Looking at the official um, program, after this photo session, there's going to be a quick break of tea. Uh, but later on, we'll see a keynote address in the plenary session where there will be, of course, uh, the, um, Dr. Moses Wetangula, who's the speaker of the National Assembly of Kenya, uh, giving a keynote address in the plenary about environment, climate change, and the role of parliament. Uh, later on, the Speaker of Parliament of Uganda, Anita Netamong, will be also giving a keynote address on diverse and inclusive parliaments, talking about youth and gender sensitivity. Uh, that will be later on before they break off for lunch. After they break off for lunch and return in the afternoon, we'll see uh, conversations happening. Um, the President of the Senate of Malaysia, that is Dr. Haji Wan Junaidi bin Tuanko Jafar, will be giving or presenting um, on topic one, that is about climate change, and that will be chaired by the Speaker of Singapore, that is Xia Kian Peng. On the other session, on the breakout session, in the afternoon, after midday, we'll see uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives of Malaysia, that is uh, Tan Sri Dato Dr. Bin Abdul, uh, who will be giving a keynote address or presenting on diverse and inclusive parliaments. That will be chaired by the Speaker of the House of Assembly of Barbados, that is Arthur Holder. And uh, later on in the afternoon, that does not stop there, but in the afternoon, all will be, of course, uh, seeing uh, the Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies of Rwanda speaking about environment, climate change, and the role of Parliament. Late in the evening, we'll see uh, Group A uh, break out to have conversations thereafter. There is going to be a welcome dinner that is going to be hosted at about 7 p.m., and uh, that will call it a day. What we've just seen is a photo section of all the speakers and presiding officers represented here. We've seen uh, a representation from countries like Malaysia, India, Barbados, um, Mauritius, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, um, Zambia, and many other countries. Yesterday was uh, uh, day one, this is day two, that has the official opening ceremony, and looking forward to how conversations, especially those uh, that are going to be uh, on the agenda. We are looking forward to conversations on climate change and the environment, uh, looking forward to conversations on inclusive parliaments, conversations that also be really about um, in, um, gender and youth sensitivity, conversations on uh, security of parliamentarians, but also on the last day there's going to be conversations about the health and well-being of parliamentarians and presiding officers. Part of this conference, we're going to be discussing how speakers can be experts um, in uh, making sure that they do um, interpret the rules of procedure. They are experts to make sure that uh, they chair sessions and rise about above party interests, make sure that uh, they sometimes have to rise above party interests and show impartiality and many other things. And uh, well, now there's going to be a break, uh, but thereafter, we're going to go into breakout sessions where environment, climate change, and the role of parliaments will be at or taking center stage.
The Parliament of Uganda will be hosting the 27th Conference of Speakers and Presiding Officers of the Commonwealth in Kampala from the 3rd to the 6th of January 2024. The conference to be held at the Munyonyo Commonwealth Resort will attract speakers and presiding officers from 52 Commonwealth countries. It aims to maintain, foster and encourage impartiality and fairness on the part of speakers and presiding officers of parliaments and promote knowledge and understanding of parliamentary democracy. The topics of discussion at the conference will include environment, climate change, and the role of parliament, diverse and inclusive parliaments, youth and gender sensitivity, and security measures for parliamentarians and parliaments. The others are health and well-being support in parliaments and role of speakers and presiding officers. Delegates, accompanying persons, and other officials expected to grace the conference present opportunities to create business and entrepreneurial linkages to cement trade relations with the visiting delegations. The high-level event comes with increased tourism hits and its attendant dividends for the small, medium, and large-scale investors across the tourism value chain. The Parliament of Uganda and all Ugandans welcome the delegates to Uganda and wish them a memorable time during and after the conference. Amos Wekesa is a spirited and devoted advocate and champion for Uganda. His never-ending optimism, curiosity and passion for all things Ugandan can be felt in every tweet and interaction. Amos also puts his money where his mouth is by investing in domestic tourism so that people get a feel of what Uganda has to offer. Amos, a grateful nation thanks you. You are unstoppable. MTN, the Unstoppable Network, celebrates you. Visit GreatLakeSafaris.com and together, let's support Ugandans like Amos who are driving our country's unstoppable progress. Whatever sport you enjoy, Sport Action on NBS Sport has you covered. Whether you want to support the Uganda Cranes or our netball team, golf or athletics, both domestic sporting events in Uganda and international sporting events in which Ugandans compete are the subjects of our attention. What are you still holding out for? Catch all the excitement on Sport Action by tuning to NBS Sport, brought to you by MTN, the number one supporter of Ugandan sports. Sarah, these two are creeping into your personal space. Why don't we send them packing? Or maybe not. With Nextcom, you can expand the impact of your message. In an age where ambition knows no bounds, Nextcom is your unrivaled strategic communication partner. We don't just amplify your brand's voice, we create communication solutions that move the cash needle. We develop your ideas into industry-defining transformations through well-designed and executed campaigns and disruptive techniques. Why accept ordinary when you can create extraordinary? Contact us immediately and let us design a future in your brand lean. Nextcom, your communications partner. Kabodi 
Everywhere you go, MTN. Ekule na wansu wa mateka ga UCC. Program Liner brought to you by Shop and Pay with Momo the easy and safe way. Use the MTN Momo app or dial star 165 star 3 hash. Paying with Momo is free. MTN Momo. NBS happening now. Thirteen, stipulates that the officers of the conference shall be chaired by two chairpersons and the secretary. Currently, whereas we have the chairperson who is my good self, and the Secretary General just next to me, we do not have the two vice chairpersons. The next item therefore in the agenda is the election of the vice chairpersons. The usual CISPO practice is to have the upper house counterpart of the host speaker become the vice chair. And traditionally, the second vice chairperson comes from the next hosting country of the next CISPO conference. However, in Uganda, we have a unicameral parliament. As such, I would like to propose my very able deputy speaker the Right Honorable Thomas Taeba as the first vice chairperson of the conference. Is it seconded? Seconded by. <laughs> Thank you so much. The eyes have it. Congratulations, uh, my, my young brother. In addition, India is the next host of the next conference, the 28th. I would also suggest that we have Honorable Shir Singh being the second vice chair of the conference. Is that seconded? Seconded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Colleagues, since we are in agreement with that, Number three is the nomination of the procedures for 2024-2026 standing committees. I would now like to turn to our CISPO secretary, Ian. Would you briefly describe on the nomination procedure for 2024-2026 standing committees? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. The mandate of the current standing committee expires at the end of this conference. Accordingly, at the closing plenary on Saturday, January 6th, a new standing committee will be elected. To this end, you will have received a pink 
uh, colored paper as part of your pre uh, registration kit, which is the nomination form, to assist with the election process for the next, uh, for the 2024-2026 Standing Committee. On one side, you will find an extract of the CSPOC rules describing the membership of the Standing Committee, including the representation or seat allocation per region. On the other side, you will find the nomination form, which must be returned to me by the end of the day today. At the end of the workshop sessions this afternoon, delegates will be invited to meet in regional caucuses to discuss their nominees for the Standing Committee. Once decided upon, the nomination forms must be submitted to me again before the end of the day. If you cannot find me at that time, please feel free to submit the form to one of the conference staff who will gladly pass it along to me. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Ian. We have the venue for the next conferences and the meetings. That is our item number four. Honorable colleagues, I would like to remind you that a number of parliaments have generously agreed to hold either the up, up, upcoming CISPOC Standing Committee meetings or a full conference meetings. Gaoneshi is to host the Standing Committee in 2025. It has proposed, it has offered. That is Standing Committee meeting. India is to host the full conference in 2026 and uh, tentatively. Trinidad and Tobago will host since they were previously supposed to host the Standing Committee in 2023, so they will host it in 2027. 2028, United Kingdom to host a full conference like this. At the end of the last conference in Australia, the eyes of the man offered to host the Standing Committee meeting in either 2027 or 2029. The Parliament of Pakistan offered to host a full conference in 2030. The Standing Committee recently considered these offers and thanks to the parliaments for their offers to host and recommendations. These are to be given to the plenary for your approval. If you're in agreement with those countries hosting, then Yes, Kenya. Yes. Thank you, uh, conference chair and our host. Uh, I've heard you mention that uh, the UK has put a bid or an offer to host the conference, to which, as Kenya, we'd have no problem. But I want to raise an issue that uh, as the Commonwealth, we are bound by our common history, whose umbilical cord is the UK. But I wonder whether it is prudent and reasonable to give the UK a privilege of hosting a conference when, from what I hear and what I know, it has engineered a boycott of certain countries in attending this conference. You can't have your cake and eat it at the same time. Should we, as uh, the poorer uh, commonwealth, or those who are on the receiving end from the speech from your president this morning, continue supplicating ourselves to our members who want to play hot and cold on issues of the Commonwealth, even if we don't agree on certain issues, it is always sensible to meet as we are meeting and register our dissent or agreement on whatever issue. But a country that is boycotting a conference should not be given the privilege to host a conference which they have boycotted. And I would want to encourage that we rethink the offer by offending members from enjoying those privileges. 
Many of us, of course, would want to go to the UK, but many of us also will do without going to the UK if the conduct is such condescending towards some of our member countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Members, that is the view from one of the members. Any other? And I will put it to vote. Any other? Yes. Madam Speaker, um, it's with great privilege that I speak amongst uh, distinguished speakers, and I wish to observe all protocol before I proceed. With due respect to my fellow colleague from Kenya, um, I believe that uh, those concerned are not at the table because of their own choice. Yet, um, I believe perhaps it may be prudent to wait until they are here. Um, what comes to mind is that if you're not on the table, um, you're on the menu. And uh, I believe that uh, we are a commonwealth of sovereign and equal um, countries and nations. And even though those who are not here to speak for themselves are not here to defend their positions, I think it would be um, good for us to, to give them an opportunity to reply. Um, otherwise, we'll be preempting um, the situation. I completely understand where my fellow speaker from Kenya is coming from. And um, I just want to keep the peace, if, if that's possible. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, being one of the members that has been banned from traveling, I wouldn't want to be the one to chair a meeting that is making such a decision of, um, of rejecting UK from hosting. It will be like I'm paying back. Uh, I would request that we refer this to the next standing committee meeting to make a decision on this position. What do you think as a house? Agreed. Agreed? I think, I think, I think IPU, I just... agreed? Um, ideally, yes. I'll give a sentence thereafter. But let me take this opportunity to um, thank you, the hosts, but also the colleagues who have spoken here. Thank you for actually uh, electing me as the president of IPU. I really appreciate the support that I received from all of you. Thank you so much. I'm very honored. And I'm open to ideas on how we can make IPU more effective. So thank you. I'll keep it short. Um, now, on the issue at hand, I agree with you because, like you said, uh, you will be conflicted if you're chairing. But on the, on the other hand, I think the concern has been raised and maybe it should be communicated to our colleagues in the UK that there are such concerns from other countries who would like, as members of the Commonwealth, who would like to attend. And uh, considering the circumstances, uh, they should look into that because they are only hosting. Uh, if a country was banned from the Commonwealth family, that's something else. If a country is still a member and there are specific individuals that a particular country which is going to host a certain meeting is not accepting them, I think those concerns should be raised. And uh, let's not really reach a point where we have to make a decision on that. Let the concerns be communicated and le let them do the needful. We have had such circumstances before where they might want to, if they if they are going to insist, we don't know how many countries are banned. Yes. So I, I think it only it's only fair that we communicate to them and then maybe in the next meeting they will be able to say what their Thank stand you. is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Madam so much. I, I think Honorable Wetangula raises very pertinent issues which affect all of us as countries. 
as members of uh, the Commonwealth. And what I will request the Secretary to do is to communicate The Parliament of Uganda will be hosting the 27th Conference of Speakers and Presiding Officers of the Commonwealth in Kampala from the 3rd to the 6th of January 2024. The conference to be held at the Munyonyo Commonwealth Resort will attract speakers and presiding officers from 52 Commonwealth countries. It aims to maintain, foster and encourage impartiality and fairness on the part of speakers and presiding officers of parliaments and promote knowledge and understanding of parliamentary democracy. The topics of discussion at the conference will include environment, climate change, and the role of parliament, diverse and inclusive parliaments, youth and gender sensitivity, and security measures for parliamentarians and parliaments. The others are health and well-being support in parliaments and role of speakers and presiding officers. Delegates, accompanying persons, and other officials expected to grace the conference present opportunities to create business and entrepreneurial linkages to cement trade relations with the visiting delegations. The high-level event comes with increased tourism hits and its attendant dividends for the small, medium, and large-scale investors across the tourism value chain. The Parliament of Uganda and all Ugandans welcome the delegates to Uganda and wish them a memorable